I think the recording has started. Let's start. Uh, welcome again, everyone, to today's guest talk again. So we are going to be having a very interesting conversation with our guest, Dagim. Dagim, welcome to, to, to 10 Academy Big Time. We are super excited to learn from you today. So my fellows, uh, 10 Academy fellows, can we give him some reactions, some welcome reactions before we do the introduction? Okay, okay, super amazing. Thank you, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. So a little bit of introduction. Dagim is uh, a site reliability engineer at Google, and also he has a background in Amherst College uh, being double major in computer science and neuroscience, something really huge. And I will really leave this precious time to him just to even share us more about himself. But the main topic for today or the main focus uh, of the presentation that he's going to be doing today, it's on application of AI in messaging. So I believe as the biggest tech enthusiasts as we are here. I believe we are super excited to be learning from what he prepared for us today. So enjoy the session. Dagim, I can leave the floor to you. You're welcome. Hi, uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, um, so to preface, um, I threw this, not even collection of slides, but I threw three slides together just to have a general uh, idea of what to talk about. But I'm expecting to be, for this to be very more, very much more so informal. And if you guys have any questions that you want to ask me to stop me and ask at any point, um, it was just more so what is my experience in this world? Because um, my role is not technically anywhere near AI, but as it is everywhere at this moment, we all have to, in a way, adapt. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess I can share a couple of slides as we talk about that. Yeah, so um, my name is Dagam. Uh, as got introduced, I work at Google as a site reliability engineer, and my current team is Android Messages. Been working at Google since 2022, so coming up to two years. So roughly in this world, I am a child. Um, the, my experiences are coming from, from somebody that is new into the world, Yes, with two years, you get some level of experience, but it is um, it's still not a senior engineer or anything along those lines. So when it comes to um, uh, the day-to-day -day work of a site reliability engineer and SRE, uh, at Google, they try to define it as being your 50% a suite and your 50% working on operational work. So whether it be um, you're concentrated on like reacting to pages and things being broken or um, a whole bunch of just making sure that the infrastructure runs. So what we make the infrastructure run for is the messaging app, like the default messaging app that exists on Android, which I think now has a more than a billion users monthly or something along those lines. So it is in the world of Google, still a smaller scale operation than other things, but it is still a place of very large number of users. And we need to make sure that everything is served well, everybody's happy. And because in the world of, let's say, a billion, if you're 99% good, that still leaves a 1% error rate, which is pretty high in terms of the amount of users that you have. Um, so there are there's like the most simple thing of like how do we bring AI into this is as you've seen in a lot of places and I've also seen a lot of in short startups be like this is integrations. 
So you integrate existing, whether it be, whether chatbots directly into your product, whatever it is, um, and you just make it slightly better for the user, slightly better for the use case that you want to try to push it for. Um, in the messages case, we have currently integrations with Gemini. Um, what we what we do is, for example, if you are let's say creating a message, you can draft it as however we want. Uh, I think one thing they really like is like, oh, drafting as Shakespeare, drafting as whatever. It's like you use it not necessarily as something that is like, oh, this is the core thing of my system. Because at the end of the day, when people think of messaging, what they want to do is I want to send a message to somebody else. I want to send, let's say, like high quality images. Um, I think one of the big fights between like Apple and, and Android is, oh, I can't send you good quality messages or whenever you add me to a group chat. So those are like the core works and the core things that we care about. But at the same time, in this current world, you have to integrate things just because that is where the world is pushing and you have to innovate before at the end of the day, it's like, oh, okay, you've been left behind in certain cases. Um, and another thing that's recently being uh, beta tested and being pushed out is an ability to chat directly to Gemini from the Google app, from the Messages app. So in this way, it is saying, okay, these are the core things that the company cares about. Google cares about Gemini. And now we're going to take that and we're going to bring that into our app, into what we're using, so that now um, we can say, yes, we're involved, evolving and yes, yes, we're integrating the shiny new things that exist. But this is not um, the majority of, let's say, my work specifically, because um, mostly my concern is on the back end. And it gets harder to integrate chatbots, as fancy as they are, into the back end. Um, so as, you're go as we're going through certain things, sorry, for some reason, the sun decided to be very, very bright. Okay, better. Um, so outside of that, it is I, as an SRE, working with the messages, I don't get near training models as much as I would like, or it's, if it's something I do, it's something that I would do on the side, just because there are people that are, you know, that have done their PhDs that wrote the papers on transformers and all that working on training these models to make sure that they are as good as they can be in there using it for whatever cases so what comes to our cases even outside of um these general ais as somebody that's not training these models what we would use it for is we solve our existing problems that would take a lot of human toil and this goes back to now it's been fancied up and now everything's ai but this thing has been going on for a while right um it started with smart algorithms that would look at certain things and then okay we started training whatever type of networks whatever type of transformers whatever it is and so now they even within the company even outside of the company there is a lot of like machine learning enhanced solutions or things that basically work at an infrastructure level. Um, and one of these things might be as simple as, okay, we have, we use resources and resources is a very big thing right now um, due to the AI race, everybody's buying up all the CPUs, TPUs, GPUs. So one of, as an infrastructure worker in the back end, your one of your main problems is how do I use less and give more because at the end of the day machines are expensive uh but also machines are very rare to come by so what we do is we make sure that we're using um existing models and existing infrastructure solutions and catering them and like tweaking them for our use case to make sure that our jobs aren't running hot uh, basically means we're using less resources that means we're using less money and in the current world of, okay, we're trying to invest everything we have into AI, um, whenever you have like core products, but they are not necessarily AI programmed uh, and they won't require that much uh, intensive co compute power, you start working on things that are 
basically making your service more efficient and your service um, more clean. And another thing is uh, there are a lot of things to, that you can use to train. Um, for example, one thing I use is Notebook LM, which is um, part of Google's like suite things, uh, like AI suite that they, re they, they release, which is to train existing, basically you train the model on your documents, on your PDF files, on whatever it is, um, and have basically a collection. And yes, you have to fact check it at points, but a collection of things that you can say, oh, you can ask it a question about what the work is or what you're currently looking at. And instead of you having to comb through like thousands and thousands of lines, you can jump in and search through it. So that becomes the aspect of using such models to support my work instead of replacing my work. Because um, at the end of the day, it is very easy um, to say, okay, we can fully automate this thing out, but there is still currently a space for having my knowledge or having somebody else's a human's knowledge to work with that because as you've seen, like these models as great as they are, they can be a bit hallucinative. Like they hallucinate sometimes, they try to add certain things that doesn't necessarily line up. So um, I think it goes back to if you have ever used whether chat GPT, whatever, whatever, or Gemini to code, sometimes they would they might give you a good result or something like that. But sometimes it might give you a rest. You might ask it multiple times. People are like, oh, can you adjust this? Can you not? And things on top of that. But still, there is a need or there is a use of having some level of internal knowledge or knowing things about the system where you can be like, OK, this is a useful or a useful start point or a useful idea that it's trying to give me, and I can fix it. With the notebook LM, it's like, OK, I can get generalized answers and where it thinks it exists within my collection of documents where it says, oh, this is the answer. I'm like, OK, but from what I know and from what my personal experience has been, that doesn't necessarily align. It gets me closer to where I need to be. So you use it for efficiency, but not fully replacing it. Um, one thing that I've seen in that is a lack of is if somebody is trying to, you know, train their own models or work on things is that there is a very, very big lack of correct information when it comes to, in short, countries that are less represented. Um, so if we were to come to Ethiopia or mostly any African country, uh, it basically there is not necessarily a lack of data, but there is a lack of good data for them to be training models. Language, I think, is now in part getting better. Um, but even that, it's like nuances, as you've seen, it's hard to capture just because if you mainly think about it, right, majority of people working on these uh, structures are in Silicon Valley. Like they live, like, um, I live and work in San Francisco. You can see a whole bunch of people in like Mountain View, Palo Alto. Uh, all the things are in one place. And as much as diverse their workforce could be, there is a lack of, OK, how many how many people that actually work on these systems understand things that are region specific or nuanced, whether whenever they say, oh, OK, is this model accurate whenever it's answering questions? Um, and the other might be in Europe or might be in Asia. I know now um, Google started opening up companies, I mean, uh, like offices in I think Nairobi and Ghana, but it's still a small number of individuals working on it and not necessarily they're not working on specific training models that are for Africa, by Africa or something like that. So uh, a big, big, I think, lack in the current moment would be like whether it be, for example, messages in terms of okay we're trying to convert text and we're trying to send messages in a different language it's like oh we're generate this in this language it's still lacking just because of what it is considered or let's say for simple things as image generation i think one thing i always try to do with any of these bots is i try to make it generate uh like an image of fossil or like either any sir and majority of things i have tried have failed me in either trying to make like eggs, which is again, like 
colored eggs, which is not, for example, an Ethiopian tradition in that case, or even outside of that, um, and try to like generate images of like cities I know within Africa and then it being like whether Ethiopia or South Africa and it giving me like an old version of these cities where it's like, oh, it doesn't look as developed and the biases that people might have of like, okay, where is the developed part not being directly um, shown? Yeah, that is what I really have to say, but I would love to hear questions. Um, don't want to take too much time. All right. Our uh, thanks, Dr. Okay, a... okay. Great. We already have some questions in the chat box. Yeah. So there's a question in the chat. Uh, what are the skills that got you to your current role? What are some of the projects that Google is doing in Nairobi, Ghana, or Africa on AI? What are they always looking for? Um, Okay, for the first question, what are the skills that got me to my current role? Um, I think certain things, I, I can't say for sure because I don't know what the hiring committee was thinking or what they were saying in the back. Um, but I had applied for a software engineering role my junior year of college, and that didn't work out. I remember I did a lot of like lead code and all that fun stuff for as an intern a lot of lead code, but I don't know, just had a bad interview. Like the first question went well, fine. And then there's a second interview question and my interviewer just, I don't know, just was a combination of like, I didn't fully understand what the question was. And every time I tried to ask a clarifying question, it wouldn't work out. It just wasn't meant to be and I needed to do more. But luckily my recruiter at that point was like, oh, I can help you. Uh, like when she called me and I was like, okay, we didn't uh, offer you. We decided to not offer you this role this time. But I would suggest if you were to train more with lead code and apply back next year, it might be something that you might use. And within that time for a summer, I was applying to different uh, research positions uh, because I double majored in neuroscience and computer science. And I did um, a neuroscience internship that was more trying to mimic neuron work using uh, neural networks. It was very much so like a starter project and be like, oh, this is how we do our things in our lab uh, in the brain and cognitive sciences department at MIT. And one thing I would say helped was that being on my resume was something shiny for the recruiters to look at again, being like, oh, okay, you worked at this place. And to be honest, I did a very, very basic project, nothing um, fancy about the work, but it was about the fact that I was in somewhat involved there. And then I went deep into getting my uh, skills done with lead code, came back to the interview the next year. Um, the recruiter even uh, like contacted me before and was like, oh, are you still open to applying? And I was like, oh yeah, definitely applied. And that time it worked out. Um, so I would say the skills would be one, a wide range of activities. Um, I think having something that wasn't fully, that was, yes, still CS related and like uh, training models, but it was slightly different from what they've seen in it being something to do with neuroscience and some other um, uh, interest worked out. And then coming back, I guess, like there will be, there was hundreds and hundreds of like rejection letters from different places. It's just reapplying and going back to it was something that helped out. And some of the projects that Google is doing in Nairobi and Ghana, um, I my information on that is slightly limited. Uh, what I know is that they re recently, I say, but within the past year, they were turning up a new uh, engineering team within Nairobi. Um, and they tried, I think, to keep hiring within Kenya for that, if I'm not mistaken, or they tried to move around and hire, but at the same time, keep it in one place. Uh, but I, yeah, I don't know much. I think as much as a Google search might get me is where I know. You mentioned something on training AI on your own documents from Google Suite. Could you go deeper into this, how it works in general and how it's useful for you? Um, 
Yeah, so the thing would be, oh, what was it? Um, no. So I use the Notebook LM uh, platform, and it is still, I think, experimental, uh, and you can sign up for it. But what was helpful for me is the fact that because it was a graph, like it is a closed model, that basically meant I can train documents that are necessarily, um, the, one of the rules is you can't necessarily throw information that is supposed to be proprietary into any chatbot just because they're not necessarily guarded on uh, like, I guess, privacy, not necessarily privacy. What is the, the word I'm looking for? Basically, it can learn from the code that I'm giving it, let's say, about like a specific system and that code might be proprietary. And then when somebody else asks it, oh, how do I make this code? It might turn out that code. I think that's their fear. I'm not really sure. Um, but the main thing there, it just becomes use this to train my own network because it's closed system. Um, and I can throw like a bunch of like documents, files, presentations into it and get like a summarized information out of it. And that's uh, how I find it to be useful. Uh, you mentioned that lacking existing AI models lack diversity and struggle to comprehend local African languages and cultures. So just this capital could bars up to bridge it. What kind of skills and techniques should we focus on acquiring? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I guess it becomes a question of one in general, like at this point, it is good to just inform yourself of like, okay, like how does one train a model or what is best? Just basically keeping with the times. And I know these things are going so fast and so many new things are coming out and so many changes are popping out. Uh, but it becomes a thing of okay how would i do it if i if i was to do it and it shouldn't it, it's not supposed to be like a camp doesn't necessarily need to be a one person program right like you shouldn't buy yourself have to write everything and work on everything like it could be a great way to work with groups and work with people that are your friends that are trying to get to a similar role and use it as a i guess learning process and it can be a good i guess project um, I know personal projects are a big thing at the moment uh, that a lot of recruiters uh, like preach on just to show your work. But, and I guess to address this gap is half of the things you, for, for example, for your own culture and the things you know, you have the understanding of what's right and wrong and you can help in that case, right? So you know what's, so what's representing your culture or you can you have access to people that can be like okay let's make a survey and see like oh is this response right or not like or basically tagging data that exists i think that is a type of work um i'm not necessarily sure how google does it but i've read articles on like um i forget which exact company it was but how they would train their data was they have a group that is like it's a it's work that's outsourced and they might be just tagging data as, as being X or Y, right? Like, or like, okay, there's a whole bunch of things and somebody needs to sit down and tag it. And usually they outsource the work like that. And it might be tagging data that's supposed to be about Africa and India, or it might be like tra tagging data for the whole continent in one country, right? So I think that's where the gap exists, where the information itself might exist, but the way it's tagged is not as correct just because of how it's done. So that could be one way to address the gap. Um, another question from Hillary. How did you get to work at Google? Do you think there are any specific things they picked you for? Uh, I'm not sure if they picked me for anything. I, I But as I was saying, I did come in as, uh, I applied through the roles as a software engineer. Uh, but as my application was going through a process, they were like, oh, you might be a good fit for SRE. And I, at that point, did not have any clue what SRE was, but it was a job. And they said, when I go on call, I get paid more because of overtime. And I was like, say less. I'm not too concerned um, at this point in time. It's a great, I've heard it's a great place to work for. Uh, it was coming near graduate. I was getting close to graduation. I was like, okay, I need a job. My visa dependent on it and everything along those lines. 
Um, but luckily it was an organization that I think was a good fit for me just because my concentration was never really just computer science or a lot of coding. And I still get to code a lot, but it becomes something of my main job, I would call it, if I was to shorten it to a couple of words, is problem solving. So there's a problem and I need to solve it. And it could be with code, it could be without code, it could be working through the system, it could be finding a thing about it versus uh, some sweet roles that are just about creating new features or something like that. But it really does depend on your team. So I think the specific thing might be that I, I had a variety of experiences in my background. Yes, I had software engineering internships. I had a research internship that they were looking at. Question from Margaret. What roles do you think are being phased out currently at Google? Which ones are being picked up on most recently? I don't know. That's pretty hard to see. Um, the company is always constantly evolving and changing. Yes, things. Um, one might say, okay, things about AI get more thing get more support, but that doesn't mean they're hiring all AI engineers because you know the company needs to be running and working, and each system that is useful is, needs to be supported. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the general cases. Like I know, like within our team, like our concentration has been the same pre Gemini OpenAI era and post. It's like okay, make sure that messaging systems are good. Um, yeah, let me take a question from the live audience. Oh, Rebecca. Uh, OK. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. OK, so uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, what what are the major misconceptions about AI developers that more technical and since you are uh, like w inside the Google? So, uh, like more technical person understands that majority of the people don't. So, in terms of uh, adoption, teacher work, or even businesses. So, how do you think it will affect their future? Hmm. Like where, uh, where, where would their directions and everything? I guess um, one general thing I would have seen a misconception that I've seen is not everyone um, is working on creating new models even within the like the teams that are for ai it's just um like there is a good number of people that are very much hard concentrated on like making groundbreaking research making sure that these things are working uh to get you like better information better results and there are people on the other side that are making sure that these things are running efficiently and these things are able to not cost as much. These things are able to be useful. So I think one thing to look at is the role of, I guess in the future, an AI developer, an AI engineer doesn't necessarily ground down to, okay, you need to be concentrated on the math of it and do like fancy back propagation or whatever a star algorithms that whatever you're working on um doesn't necessarily need to be that there's a wider range that exists on top of that um do you believe that obtaining a computer science degree is necessary for securing top ai jobs or do you think it's possible to acquire the necessary skills and knowledge without formal edu education in that field um that is i i can't say I know necessarily, but from what I can see, the majority of the roles that are open are for either people that have had experience in top places with the work they're doing for a long time, or for people that either have like masters on the specific the like the top top AI jobs of like okay, where you're working on cutting edge things at the moment, right? So if it is, if you're trying to break into the companies that are existing, you either need to show them, oh, I have had these very, very successful products, or I have had the teachings from a very important, like quote unquote, place that they acknowledge. Uh, of like, okay, yeah, this is, this is a master's degree that you know your work. 
Um, because it's pretty, I guess it's as much as it is informal and as much as it's open, they are still pretty much stuck in the old ways of, okay, degree means something in the context of, not necessarily you know your stuff, it's like, okay, you've been able to go through a series of steps and you're able to hit your quarterly goals or your biweekly goals or you're work, able to work in a system, same time. Like if you have been in a, like, I guess, skills in that field if you've shown that you've been able to hit consistent goals within your company or whatever then they can also take that into consideration but again um i'm not necessarily the one that is on the hiring side or the recruiting side to know what to do uh, okay, so you mentioned about uh, having not having a new model. So, like, if if I'm trying, if I'm uh, getting this right, like, don't you think uh, training a new model it would be expensive? Maybe that is why they are not doing it, or even fine tuning a new model. Or do you mean the uh, another training on models? Um. Well. Sorry, what do you mean about training a new model? Because they still always train new models, whether they don't release them. They try to like better their existing models by training them, or they try to create new models that do different things. Yeah, it is it is it is very expensive. Um, but for like their scale, it is fine in what ways? Um, I think there are like How do I describe it? For it to be something functional and successful, yes, it does need like money backing from a larger company in whatever case. Whenever you would, let's say, train your own model or make something, it is mostly to be like, okay, look, this how this works better. And it is more so a thing to show, oh, you made this thing. And then you might get support from larger companies. I don't know if I'm answering your question correctly but that is my understanding of it. Okay. what is the most interesting project or research that caught your attention recently um and a day in life and sorry what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis yeah i think i'll you know, i'll do those two questions as my last just because Okay, and then the last one, do you think that this week's release from opening angle? Um, just because of time constraints, and I, I, I do have to leave at 8.45. Um, but so a day in the life of an SRE. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's pretty different based on what you're working on. Like me and my teammates might have a different day-to-day. -day. But if you're on call, it's about responding to tickets, responding to page, responding to alerts, right? Something might be broken. Something that could be broken, somebody in for Orange, the carrier in Senegal, like half of the country can't send messages. Something like that might happen. Um, not necessarily like from our back end, but it might just be like Orange broke something. So you might go contact them, try to find a solution, try to help them fix the together or something on our back end might be broken and we fix that when you're not on call the day-to-day -day becomes okay what is your current project and how do you uh work with it i work on resources so how do we efficiently save a lot of money basically um one thing is uh it's kind of wild to think about but you work it is such large systems you work in the like thousands of gcu like hundreds of thousands of gcus hundreds of thousands like terabytes or even petabytes of RAM, things like that. So it's always like, okay, whenever you do save resources, you're actually saving money. Um, um, nowadays, there is, Apple has decided to support RCS, which is the modern messaging system uh, between like phones instead of SMS and like bad image quality and stuff. So that is a concentration of ours, just making sure that whenever Apple launches, we're able to message with them properly uh most interesting project or research that caught your attention um i was looking at just because of my 
what's it called my interest in uh bio and neuro there was recently something i was looking at that was one okay i have two things one is the recent uh neural link not even art like research but it's more so an article of the person that's been implanted talking about the use cases and how it's been helpful and it's like okay that's a very like it's pretty cool next step next level things uh, and another one is alpha fold three i think is that the new one which basically is the model that uh like google uses to create visualizations of what protein structures should look like and one of the things was it was messing up a part up parts so they used alpha fold 2 to teach it what's right and what's wrong so i'm like oh that's a pretty nice way of using like existing models that you know to be successful to train larger models because they might be better at other things but they might be wrong at things so like reinforcement learning or like i guess adversarial learning within itself um what do you think about this week's release from OpenAI and google i uh, pretty cool things uh I remember it's the it's wild to think that a year ago we weren't even close to this. Now we have like models that basically see and have opinions on the things they see. And on top of that, like a lot of videos, like just a whole lot of things where it's like, okay, this thing is going fast and it is wild how much it's come even within one year. I don't even want to know what happens in the next year, to be honest. Uh, there's a lot of data science tools and technologies out there. So which ones do you recommend us to learn for real world professional jobs? Um, I am not that close to data science tools um, as much as I'd say, but thing with data science, uh, I guess like languages, right? Like with, because at the basis of them, they exist. Maybe like I'd say Python, I'd say SQL, like are things that regardless of whatever your, I'm not fancier tools, I'm sorry, but like at the basis of it, I use SQL on a day-to-day -day basis sometimes just because you know I need to query this database and do some things to it and figure out what exactly is the anomaly and then throw it into Python so that I can do a bit more analysis. Um, are there any emerging trends or technologies that you are particularly excited about? Uh, I am pretty excited about, I think it goes back to just because of my neuro background, like work like Neuralink, work like any type of integration that they do. Um, there was this research paper, I think that came from Zurich about like um, using external reading to control, like basically, because we've been able to record a lot of brain data. And now because we have like better and better models that we can train, doesn't necessarily need to be like generative AI or anything like that, but um, good ML models and a lot of good techniques and a lot of TPUs and a lot of if you use to run things on, you can make things. Uh, what motivates you, the money or the work? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I would say, because at the end of the day, I would say the work, just because I've been in a very privileged position of like, at, like Google pays well, um, and I know there are, places that might be like, okay, they pay slightly well. Like I, um, there's a lot of like quant firms, like quantitative analysis ones that are like, they, like recruiters would reach out to you or something like that. Or um, the scary firms, um, like the military firms, they also pay like significantly more at points. Um, but I'm able to say, okay, no, that's not necessarily work I wanna do just because I am in a privileged position and lucky enough to be paid well. Uh, at Google, um, and as much as I would say yes, I'm really talking from a point of privilege, so I can't really talk too much, but say much about it in that way. But at every point, my like starting early on, my father used to always say like, make sure that the work you do is something that you care about, or else you will get burnt out and you hate it. And that is very true. Um, and the reason I went into computer science wasn't because everybody was like, oh, computer science is great and you need to do it. It was because when I was younger, like early days, we used to have an internet cafe. Uh, this is like, like two computers and people would just dump in, do internet in our like, tiny shop. Um, and 
because of that, like my sister would be like, okay, time to format these drives because every time people would like come to use the internet and they would open the most random websites and viruses would be all over the PC. And we'd like do the formatting and everything. And I was like, wow, computers are so cool. So that, because that was like a spark of my, when I was younger, that was something I actually wanted to do. And luckily I've been able to follow that path. Like, uh, thank God always for this because I've made it to this point where I was like, when I was younger, I was like, oh, that'd be really cool to do it. And for my younger self, I'd be interested or happy in this point. Is it possible to drop your GitHub or LinkedIn links? Sure, I think I have my LinkedIn somewhere. Uh, what is it? I think this is my name. Yeah, but also don't be uh, disappointed because I don't really post a lot or use LinkedIn or uh, in GitHub. Like majority of my work doesn't require me to work on GitHub, so then we'll see that. I guess the last question, if, if you were to do postgraduate research, what field would you conduct your research in and what problem would you be concerned about? I think if I was to do postgraduate research, I would go back into something that is overlapping between uh, like neuroscience and computer science, just more like similarly problem solving work. I enjoy the work I do now because it is a lot of problem solving work. But here the problem becomes, it's like, okay, how do we understand the brain more? Or how do we like find a certain system or how do we model it better? Yeah. Uh, I hope this was helpful. Thank you for listening, y'all. I do have to leave. Uh, I do need to make it into the office, but it was really nice speaking to y'all. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Takim, uh, for sharing us your experience and your knowledge. We highly appreciate it. Uh, and of course, for answering every single question, that's really so much appreciated. So. Uh, yeah, we look forward to be connecting with you more. I believe uh, people are going to, anyway, uh, be connecting with you on LinkedIn just to keep the connection and even for any chances for future interactions. Mm -hmm. So we look forward to that. So thank you so okay. much for joining us big time. We highly appreciate us, the 10 Academy community here. We have like four programs of people who are here. So I believe we all learned something. And to right. also, yeah, absolutely. So for the record, um, Pascaline, I realized I did not introduce myself. I was here with the other community manager called uh, Emilia as well. So we appreciate you big time. Right. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Have a great evening.